Let's just bow our heads for a word of prayer, please. Isn't it good to pray? And isn't it even better to know that when we pray, we have a Heavenly Father who hears and answers prayer? That's the best part of it all. So, Heavenly Father, we come once again this amazing Sunday. This is the day that you've created, you've made for us. You've told us to set aside time to be with you, that it might be a day of rest. And that rest for us is not just being able to sleep in, but that rest for us is a restoration, a physical restoration, where our bodies, during this day, we drop the frantic activities that we go through all week long. We drop those today. And we say, Lord, our bodies need to stop. They, they need to be physically restored and refreshed. Not only that, but our minds need that, Lord, as well. And so when you said this would be a day of rest, you meant that. And you saw the benefit that it would bring to all of your children. And Lord, sometimes it looks like around us that the... Um, the world has forgotten all about the day of rest. They just go chugging right along as though every day is the same. And Because of that, we see the breakdown of society. We see the breakdown all around the world where people have ignored the principles of God. So we thank you for this day of rest that you created. And not only was it a day of rest for us physically and for us mentally, but it's a day of rest for us spiritually. It's a time that we can come together and we can see each other. Literally, we can see each other in person. And even though we come, Lord, with our flaws, and even though we come with our weaknesses, we come together and we aren't forsaking the assembling of ourselves. We are obeying the Word of God. And so we come together and we, we have, again, a refreshing of our spirit. We have a refreshing of our body. We have a refreshing of our minds. As we meet with fellow Christians and as we associate together, then we, we discover the things that have gone wrong in each other's lives and then things that have gone right. And times during our week that we've had to look to you for our help. When we've had to look for you for our strength. And so we thank you, Father, for this. And we pray that you'll make this Lord's Day, this Sabbath day, a day of rest in every way. That uh, by midnight this evening, we'll be able to say, this, this was a good day. This was a day that I now sense the presence of God much more clear in my life. That my mind is refreshed, that my body is refreshed, and my spirit has been lifted into heavenly places in Christ. How we praise you and give you thanks. We ask it in the precious, powerful name of Jesus. Amen. And amen. Amen. Well, hallelujah. Um, I, I just want to acknowledge my wife, Lorna, that's with us. Lorna, would you maybe just come here? Uh, she, she, she didn't know I was going to do this, but I want you to see her from the front, not from the back of her head. And... Uh, <laughs> This will be f 53 years in November that we've been married. Yeah, I'm right. <laughs> I figured it out before I came up here. Uh, no, I, I knew what it was. It's 53 years this coming November, and uh, it, this has been quite a ride. We've been in ministry pretty well all of those years, starting back in 19, about 1970, I guess it was. And uh, at first, Lorna was raised on a farm. So she thought all of her life, I'm going to marry a farmer. Ha ha. What, what a surprise when she married a preacher. Uh, did you want to just say a couple of words, whatever comes to your heart? It hasn't been all that bad. I, I learned um, I didn't have to milk cows anymore, which is a good thing. It's not a bad thing at all. <laughs> I just found it hard to be a pastor's wife at first because... I had been raised brethren, and they don't have pastors. They have speakers come in. And I wasn't sure what my role was, and I didn't really anticipate that it was going to be great because I didn't think I knew how. 
<laughs> so I finally, uh, I finally sort of started to fit in because I found an old pastor's wife who told me that um, you just have to be a wife and a mother, you know, and you, you do that. And then if there's other things that you feel you like to do, you tell the church instead of them all telling you what to do because they told me to do things I'd never done in my life and I didn't know how and I was scared. But they wanted me to be the president of the Women's Council and they wanted me to be the Sunday School Superintendent and they wanted me to play the organ and I tried to do that. I mean, I did try to play the organ and I finally got so I could do that. But I was always worried and then once this lady told me what I, what I could do, I felt like I'd been freed, and I loved pastoring after that. <laughs> we've, had a good, we've had a good time, haven't we? Absolutely. Yep. <laughs> Amen. Thank you. Amen. Yeah, the one thing they didn't tell Orna to do was preach. But they, they have asked her to come and speak. And when she does, and she has preparation, she does a really good job at that as well. So uh, when the Lord said he'll provide you with a help meet, he, help meet, help, he meant that. Uh, he's able to do that. And uh, somebody that comes along and has been able to be as faithful and involved, you always have to acknowledge that and give God thanks. Amen. Amen. Before I... Before I minister, one of my one, one of the things that I do on a constant basis is I, I sort of say, Lord, Lord, what what do you want to say to the people? Hello. I mean, I, I have a book of sermons. I mean, I've got many books of sermons. Uh, I got files, uh, all kinds of. I, I mean, I could preach. You you know, I could preach for the next ten or twenty hours. And as long as I had strength, but I have the material that I could keep on preaching and talking and sharing. But but that isn't really what I have sensed in the last several years of my ministry. Uh, what I've sensed, and it goes way back, but what I've sensed more importantly in the last while is that it's really important that somehow or another I catch the breath. Do you hear it? The breath. Of the Holy Spirit in the first book of the scripture Genesis and in the very early chapter he says and the breath of God breathed upon now that's what makes the difference when it comes to ministry because you can have people who will be great teachers and they'll be great expositors and they'll be great communicators so they can they can wow you but afterwards you get up and you leave and you think like what did they say? And about an hour or two later, you don't remember a word. Hello? You don't remember a word that they've shared. Like it's just been in one ear and literally out the other. <clears throat> Nothing has been retained either here or here. And so one of the things that I've tried to do is, um, when I know I'm going to be speaking, I, I try to say, Lord, what do you want to say specifically to these people? And when I've done that, it surprises me. It shouldn't, you know, but it does. It surprises me when people come up later and say, H how did you know that? Like, how, how come you hit the nail on the head? Like, and I, I'm always, I'm sort of amazed and as well as amused by it, if you know me. Um, I'm amused that somehow or another, God uses a human instrument to convey his word again. He did it, he did it in the scripture, and he did it in other ways. But once again, he has chosen people who become his voice, that the Holy Spirit speaks through, and that you become a conduit, that you become a vessel to whom the Holy Spirit speaks. And that that to me, like that's what preaching is really all about. To do my 10 or 20 hours of notes that I've prepared uh, over and over again, I could do that, is one thing. And maybe that's impartation of good information. 
but in churches I have found that people when they come together they have they have needs like almost every almost every individual here has needs and it's based upon so many different things and circumstances in life for some of us and I've only entered this recently but for some of us it's based on on age hello like I was never old before that's that should be obvious <laughs> But the truth is, I was never old before, so I didn't know the things that I would be needing from God for this season of my life. And now I'm beginning to experience those things, and the same God that was there when I was going through that season of being young, and middle-aged, and then with children, and then with problems, and with business, and finance, all of those things, God is able to be the same God through every one of those seasons of your life. And so when I look out over the congregation, you see different ages, you see different phases that people are at. Like one of the phases that we're entering right now, and this is maybe as a nation and maybe the world, one of the phases that we're entering right now is going to be a time of poverty. It's going to be a time of poverty. Because things are changing so quickly, and not just in our country and not just in our city, but it's happening entirely around the world. And so people need to be asking themselves, am I going to be able to live for God as successfully when I enter that phase and that season as I am right now? Am, am I going to be able to depend upon the Lord as much then as I do right now? So for many in Canada, as you get into the older years, all of a sudden you pick up a pension. Well, who's ever had free money before? Like... About the 25th or 26th of the month, I say to Lorna, I think our paycheck came in. And you go to your bank account, and there somebody has deposited blank, blank, blank money into your account so that now you have sufficient to go on for the next month or whatever. So some things have been in place and come into place and into play and factor in our lives that have been a major blessing. But the real question is, as most of the world slides into poverty and quickly. Like one of the countries that I have visited many, many times, I've been watching that country just literally collapsing. Like month after month, it was, it's not even year after, it's month after month they're collapsing. And even now, right now, even take the, 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 the war that's going on in Russia and Ukraine, we're seeing now the country of Russia a country that has been very stable. Now we're seeing, with so many sanctions, we're seeing tremendous poverty beginning to hit the people. And you can go to the bank as many times as you want, but you can't get anything out. And if you get anything out, it's not worth very much. And we're thinking, well, that's just happening over to them because they're bad right now. Well, look, at God loves the Russians as much as he loves the Canadians. Like, let's get things straight. There will always be evil men that will do evil things. And unfortunately, sometimes they take over a country and manipulate the lives of millions. So when you look at that country, don't look at it as though it's filled with evil people. Look at it as though these are people that God made, the same as he made us. So these different seasons in our life bring us to the place where we have to ask ourselves, am I now and will I then still rest upon the promises of God? <coughs> and the question has got to be, and the answer has got to be yes. That's the question. But the answer has to be yes. Wherever the Lord leads me, wherever the Lord takes me, I will still trust in his promises. So that brings me to my scripture this morning. And it's, uh, it's probably half of you have memorized a lot of it anyway. It's it's chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews. And so all of you who have studied the word of God know that this is called the great faith chapter. It's called the great faith chapter. I was, uh, you can turn to it, but and listen to me in the meantime. I, I was thinking about faith. All week long as I'm thinking of my message, I'm thinking about the subject of faith. I've, I've been a builder and done some building, including, I think, about 13 churches 
that I've worked on and whatever. But um, one of the things about faith is this. When I was a builder, I, I, I knew there were codes that I had to follow. And if I followed the codes, the building code, for example, of Canada, I knew that whatever I did structurally would stand. So when I came in this morning, and this is uh, part of the illustration that I feel the Lord shared with me. When I came in this morning, I never came up here and checked out this platform. I, I know how it should be built. But by faith, in whoever did the work, I just came in, I sat down, and I knew when Pastor invited me to speak, I could come up on the platform. And if I got excited and jumped around up here, this thing would hold. Hello? Because I had simple faith. Sometimes we call it like childlike faith. So when we approach this book and we, we talk about these people, this is the thing that is so necessary, is that there, be un, that there be the understanding that we need to have simple faith. We need to have childlike faith. You say, well, that's, that sounds pretty you know, foolish in these days. But it isn't really. Because our faith is built on and established upon the code that God already put in place. And God says, if you do these things, I'll do these things. Hello? It, 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 it's, it's extremely simple. So that when, you, when you're walking in your Christian life, if you follow the code that God has set down, then you will have success. And if you don't follow that code, you'll have failure. So I was going down through these different things, and uh, I was thinking of this platform. I know that the 2 by 4s or 2 by 6s whichever they are, usually sixes according to the size of the steps, they should be placed at 16-inch centers. And if you put the plywood on, it should go on this way across the study and going that way. And if you do it right, it'll be strong. It'll hold you. You won't have any worry at all. I never get on an airplane and walk around the airplane and kick the tires. I've given up on that, <laughs> probably after the first time I flew. I don't do that when I go out and get in my car. Will this thing get me home? Kick, kick. You're checking out the tires. I, I don't have, I have simple faith now that the architects and the engineers and the ones who put it together followed the code. And by following the code, they had simple faith that they just relied upon what the manufacturer had produced. The, the, the same is true for our life. And you'll understand this book and this chapter especially much better. I've often thought of Abraham. And Abraham, uh, he had his wife and family, and, and th they followed him. That, that always amazes me. Like, like Lorna and I have gone to many different churches where we've pastored and we've traveled in music and preaching. and We've done the Bible college and we've done the bookstore and we've done the Christian family campground up at Tojo's campground that we found. We've done so many different things. But Lorna and our family have all walked together. We've discussed most of these things. But when the Lord says, do this, hello? Now, now you have your code. Now you have the guideline that God is putting in place, and you just simply do what God instructs you to do. When we were at Tojo's campground, the Lord had been placing in my heart this was back many years ago, probably back about 19, I think, 79, 78. <clears throat> the Lord put in my heart that uh, w we should start a church in Barrie. And um, I'm thinking, oh, my, oh, my. Like, we lived outside of Barrie. I'm thinking, you know, like, I, I like taking over a church and running a church that has a salary. Hello? And the Lord saying to me, I think you should start a church. And he didn't say, I think. <laughs> he said, you should start a church. That, you got to watch these words, don't you? And the Lord said, you should start a church in Barrie. And I mean, oh, man, we have family. There's other Pentecostal churches there that we're involved with and love and worked in. 
and the Lord instructed me to start another one. And I, I really wasn't overly certain that I wanted to upset the apple cart and get people mad at us and, you know, whatever goes through your mind. But the Lord had spoken. Hello? So the foundation has already been set. The code has already been put in place. And so I was sitting one day on a picnic table outside our house at Tojo's Christian Family Campground. I was sitting on the picnic table. It was a nice warm day. It's a beautiful oak tree. And I'm sitting there. And all of a sudden, I look up, and I see this old man. He was probably 50. That's not old, is it? <laughs> but I saw this old man about three or 400 feet away. He'd come out of his trailer, and he, he started walking across the lawn toward me. And I wasn't sure if he was coming to see him. And he walked over, and he stood in front of me, and this is what he said. You know, you should start a church in Barrie. And I think, no. Like, like, who is this God that can speak to other people, that can reinforce, that can instruct you what he's already spoken to you? And then the man went on to say, he says, if you start a church in Barry, my wife and I will be the first people that attend it. Well, I, I, I just sensed in my spirit, be, be careful of the word felt and the word sense when you're speaking of spiritual things. Because if you live by feelings, you are going to go down. <laughs> because we, we live by faith. We don't live by feeling. Because today you'll feel good, and tomorrow you'll feel rotten, and the next day you'll die. You know, like, if, if you live by, by feelings. And I, I just sensed in my spirit that this was a confirmation God had spoken to me directly. Um... My sermon could take us about an hour, an hour and a half, if you're careful. But I knew then that God had spoken to me directly what he had said to me maybe days before, or weeks before. I don't know the time in between. But now a man had stood up, come over. And I, honestly, I never, I, I don't think I talked to that man three or four times in the whole time he was on the campground. He was just one of those people that just blended in with everybody else. But that morning, that morning, he was the voice of God in confirmation. And so we decided to go ahead and we started a church. And that was a difficult time. It's a whole story in itself. My point is simply this, that God has a standard. God has a code. God has commandments. And when he places those things in place and you obey them, then you will have success. So I take a look at the first person here that the scripture speaks of. And we got about 40 of them to go through here. We won't touch on every one of them. But um, the first person that God speaks to is Abraham. And God simply says to Abraham, you know, like, like, leave this place where you're living and, and go on over to this other place, which was actually up in Damascus into what we know of as Syria today. So God took him out of a place very near, uh, near Babylon, takes him, and he directs him to one place. And then after he's there, God says, go from here, now go down into the land of milk and honey. Now Abraham, I'm sure his wife was there with all the kids. Hello? And they're all saying, but, but Dad, we like it here where we are right now. We're all in school. We love our friends and we love the house we have. We love, like, Dad, let's stay here. This is comfortable. But Abraham says, um, I, I heard the voice of God in the spirit. And the voice of God said to me was, pack up your suitcases, whatever things that you have, pack them and go. And I will lead you. See, it's, it's, it's really important, friends, and this is what's so important, not just in our, our own personal lives, but it's important in the lives of our family. It's important in the lives of our businesses. It's really, really important in the life of our church that we, that we hear the voice of God. And so Abraham, I guess he had had enough experience in the past so that when he heard the voice of God again saying, pack up and move, he was prepared to obey God. The thing that you understand with hearing the voice of God is that there will be consequences that will come with that. 
And those consequences can be both positive and negative. You know, a lot of people will always take the positive consequences. Yay! You know, I'm moving from this church of 50 people up to a church of 400. Now I'll get $100,000 salary. Yay, yay. But, but what happens if God calls you to a place where you get nothing? Which is what Barry was for us. When we, when we opened our church, there was four people. Lorna and I and Sonia and Marty, our two kids. There was four people. We had another family come from the campground that was visiting at the campground for the weekend. So there was actually eight of us, I think it was. And so there we had eight people, four that would never come back again because they were going back to Pembroke after the weekend. And it was four of us plus four visitors is the way we started our church. And literally over the next months, there were very few more. The odd time somebody came. It's, it's, at, it's at that point that you begin to ask yourself, and maybe your kids do, and maybe your wife does, are you really sure that you are in the will of God? Are you really sure that you've heard the voice of God? I have a, I have a whole message. It's several pages long. I brought it with me in case my memory started to fail me. But it's, it's on hearing the voice of God. Abraham heard the voice of God, and he was willing to step out by, say it again, by faith. He was willing to step out by faith. Now, this is the way faith works. The scripture gives us that first part there. It says, now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Uh, I've, I've built, like I said before, I, I've built a few things, a few houses and uh, cottages and two or three motels and 13 churches, so I've built. When... Before I go to build, I can actually draw a picture of the church and I can see. Some people say through the eyes of faith, others by imagination. I can actually see what it looks like before it's even started. There's that, there's that consciousness. And that's what the eye of faith is like. The eye of faith says, if I obey God and do what God asks me, and follow the direction of God, I may not know every step up and down along the way, but I know the finished product because it's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You, you don't inherit what the final result is, but you step out and do what God called you to do. You know, one of the greatest joys, I guess, for Lorna and I is when we go back to Tojo's Christian Family Campground, like we did last summer to speak, um, what we started with very little money, I think we had about $10,000. Then we borrowed all the rest to buy it and, and built it, even got the government loan or whatever. But wherever we started and the steps in between, which went up and down to the point sometimes where we could barely live, financially, but the steps in between have brought us today to where our children and now our grandchildren are going to that place for a time of relaxation, of rest, refreshing, and renewal. Can you believe it? So, so the evidence of things not seen is now happening for us to see whatever we poured our hearts into, God has made that to become fruitful. Exceeding, the scripture says. Exceeding abundantly above all that you could ask or even think. Can you imagine? Like, I, I never imagined that that oasis up there just the other side of Elmville, I never imagined that that oasis would be there 40 or 50 years later and that people, including my own family and including my, my nieces and nephews and brothers, and sisters, they're still enjoying the fruit of that labor and it's come to a greater measure than what we had ever started it at or even when we left it and sold it. So this is the way faith works. So Abraham hears the voice of God. He gets on his camel with his family and everybody in tow, and he, and he heads out of the area of Syria there, and he heads down towards the promised land. And God had said it would be a land that will flow with milk and honey. 
Can you imagine? Milk and honey. You know, with Joshua, when Moses was leading the people, Moses said, take 10 spies, go over into the land and search out the land. They go over and they come back. How many were there? 12, eh? And 10 come back and say, I can hear them huffing and puffing. I don't know about you. I can just hear. Like, people are like that. If you, if you place a vision in front of people, many times people are huffing and puffing saying, can't be done, can't be done. Can't be done. The truth is, if God's given you a vision, he'll supply all that you need to accomplish the vision. And so those 12 spies, they go over. 10, they're huffing and puffing. They come back and they're saying to Moses, we will never do it. If you could see the size of those people, there's giants in the land. And two others, Joshua and Caleb. Remember my sermon on Joshua and Caleb here at this church? You had your dedication service here a few years ago, and I was asked to be the speaker. So I decided to speak on the person called Caleb. But all through the sermon, I called him Joshua. Through the whole sermon, I, Lord is down there. She's trying to get my attention like, hey, hey, it's not, it's, it's Caleb, it's Caleb. And th nobody corrected me on that thing all the way through the whole, it was the whole sermon. And I, and I made this mistake, so you understand you're human. But I see Joshua and Caleb coming back, and their attitude was not uh, through the eyes of I feel. Their eyes were looking through the eyes of, of faith. And their expression is, we are able to go up? No. Come on, let me help me. We are well able. Like... God will do exceeding abundantly above all that you can ask or think. It's not just you'll get through. You'll get through because you'll be well abled. It'll be above what you can ever imagine that God can do in obedience by faith to his direction. Isn't that wonderful? Like, like isn't that amazing? Doesn't that almost make you want to serve the Lord? I hope so. I hope so. Because if you're living here and you're living outside of God's grace and God's love, and you're living outside of God's plan, then your life is, is experiencing failure. And, and by failure, I don't, I'm not speaking of poverty. Poverty, by the way, isn't failure. Get it, get it really clear in your minds. If we're coming into a time that's going to be rough, poverty doesn't mean you're a failure. Because all through the Bible, we have people that were living in poverty. All through history, Christians today living in China and all throughout the world, India and all around the world are living in poverty, but they are living victorious lives compared to many people in Canada that have everything and their lives are a mess. Hello? Well, let me wrap up here somewhere because I was only given an hour to preach, so or so. But anyways, let me wrap up. You always have to have a theme. My theme is faith. You always have to have a scripture. And my, my, my scripture to finalize this is way on in. I wanted to talk about a few of these other guys as well. Like the, the scripture here gives us one of the greatest lists. Read, read the 11th chapter. When it mentions the name of somebody, go and research that person. You know what I did last night? had a friend over, celebrating their birthday with them, had a friend over, and the Lord gave me a scripture, just gave me about two or three words of the scripture. And I said, well, I don't remember where that's found. I could go to my computer, and I could type, go to the Bible program, I could type, and I would get it like that. But instead, what I did is I took my phone, an Android. I took my phone, and where it said Internet, I typed in those three or four words of the scripture, and up it popped. Can you believe it? Like, right? Just like that. So you, you have the tools available to you is what I'm saying. So when one of these names pops up, when you're reading the scripture, type in that name into your computer, into your phone. Go to your encyclopedias. For years I've been teaching and encouraging everybody to buy a Matthew Henry and everybody to buy a Bible dictionary, everybody to buy a, a Thompson Chain you know, so that they have references they can go to. Right now, you can do it. There should be no reason why you don't. But as you study every one of these personable people, these are actual living people that have lived on this earth and that God used. Go to your Bible, begin to research 
and then look through the eyes of faith in their life. Like what, what did God what did God do? Another one mentioned there was Enoch. The scripture says, and he walked with God, and he and he was not. And he wasn't because God took him. Well, one of the only two, besides Jesus, persons who lived on earth that we know that God transferred into heaven. Wow. And why? Because he walked by faith. So as you go through and you study these different people, it, it begins to build, and this is what the scripture is supposed to do. It begins to build faith in your life. And we can either build belief or unbelief. We can either build faith in people's lives or we can build discouragement. E every time, even when we have our sing-alongs, if you want to tune into a nice sing-along, Lorna and I do an hour sing-along on a Thursday night on my Facebook page. It's John McDonald you know, on Facebook. If you go to that, then Lorna and I, every Thursday night at 7.30, will be singing and playing gospel hymns for a full hour. My sister joins us, my daughter joins us sometimes, other people join us. But there'll be a, a full hour of encouraging old-time songs. And those songs are based in experience that Christians had when they went through an experience. From that experience, they wrote something that God placed in their lives. Sometimes it's sorrow. One of the, one of the great songs is, It Will Be Worth It All. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. I, I met the son of the lady who wrote that song. Her name was Esther Kerr Rustoy in California. I was going to Bible college in California. I met her son. He was in our class. I said, can you tell me a little bit about the song? He says, my mother was dying with cancer. Terminal. There was no chance. There was no hope. Medicine hadn't advanced enough to help her at all. And she's dying in her bed, and all of a sudden, this song is placed in her heart. Like, it won't be that long. It's going to be pretty soon. And she began to write, it will be worth it all. Times the day is long, da-da-da-da. I forget the other words. My trial's hard to bear. I'm tempted to complain and often to despair. But Christ will soon appear to take his children home. And of course... It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. So people not only in Bible times, but people in present times have experienced that, that rise of faith within their lives in unbelievable circumstances that would, in many cases, destroy people, destroy others, that their faith has risen. Now here's my text for this morning, and I wanted to speak on it for 15 or 20 minutes, but I'll, I'll let you let the Holy Spirit speak to you. And it's chapter 11, it's verse 38. It's uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 38. And it's just this one phrase. Of whom the world was not worthy. Can you imagine? That's it. Like, here, here are all these people who have lived, like, like we did, it says some were sawn asunder. I, I saw a picture recently where they took one of the Christians and they strung him up upside down with two legs uh, that are tied up. And there's two men, one on either side, with one of those huge uh, saws that they use to cut down a huge tree. And they take that saw and they begin to cut through his body. That's, that's sauna somber. So as you begin to read that chapter, you begin to realize it wasn't all easy. It wasn't all easy. But here's the difference. And I always like this part. But God. That's the difference. That's the whole difference in the whole story of serving Jesus. We, we may go through all kinds of things. You, you may have it pretty easy. Sometimes. But just when you think everything's going really easy, then your child goes off the rails. Anyone hear me? Everything's going good, and then all of a sudden your child's hooked on fentanyl. Hello? Everything's going good, and then all of a sudden your daughter is pregnant. Everything's, and you think, like, why would God allow this to happen to me? Well, he let it happen to your child or whatever. 
In every one of these situations, we walk by faith and not by sight. And the scripture declares, of whom the world wasn't worthy. It, it, it wasn't worthy to have these people, the worldly people. It wasn't worthy of them. They, these great servants of God deserved better. But the truth is, their reward and their home is not here. The truth is, the better in their lives is that which God has promised them. I can, I can almost hear these people here, like Paul and Silas, who are thrown in jail. Now, there's not a pastor in Canada who wants to be thrown in jail. Trust me, they're all hiding, in fact. The majority of pastors in Canada are hiding. They don't, they don't want to go to jail. So the government could pretty well do anything to our pastors and our churches today, and the pastors wouldn't respond except to say, yes, how much more do you want to take? How much more do you want to take? But the truth is, these men and women of God, they stood for what was right, they stood according to the principles of the word of God. They stood according to the standard. And many of them paid the ultimate sacrifice. But God. But they reaped God's blessing and God's promises. So the world wasn't really worthy of them. But these men and women were willing to sacrifice their lives for the sake of the gospel. And God placed in them a vision. Oh, I wish I could go there for half an hour. But God placed in their hearts a vision. They, they saw something in the spirit that no one else could see. Isn't that so? I love that. I just love that. When, when we went to, to build a church, people were saying, where are we going to get the money? Where are we going to get the money? The board was all about the same thing. Like, how can we ever afford that? It wasn't a, extravagant. Many of them had homes that were more valuable than what our whole church building was. But the, all the worry warts come out. All the people that are unbelievers amongst the saints. Hello. All the, how, are we, how are we ever going to do this? <coughs> but God. But God. So the world wasn't worthy of them, and the, maybe the world isn't worthy of you today. Just think of that for a moment. Maybe the world isn't worthy of whatever prices you're paying for the sake of the gospel. God will be using you to bless his people and to bless the world around you. But God. Got one other scripture. It's Daniel chapter 11 and verse 23. And I just got to finish with that because I think it's a good one. It ties in with what we're saying. Just the middle of the, uh, just the middle of the verse, it says, but the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Isn't that an encouraging word? But the people that do know their God, I love that. If, if you really, really know God, and God speaks to you, it will happen. Hallelujah. Because you'll do exploits, things that are so far beyond what you know you can do on your own. God will do greater things than you can ever imagine. But the people, write that one down. Daniel 11 and verse 32. Amen. Let's stand together for closing word of prayer. And we'll turn it back to the pastor. Would you stand with us, please? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, we thank you, Father, for the privilege of being here today at Christ Exalted Ministries. We thank you, Lord, for what you've been doing, not just today, for the past month, but over the years through those that have been faithful in this ministry. And sometimes, Lord, maybe it doesn't look like much is being accomplished, but we know that the records are being kept in heaven. And things that are being accomplished are being recorded there, and people will go from this place, and they'll do exploits. The people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. So, Lord, continue to bless Pastor David and the board of this church, those that attend. I ask, Lord, right now, special anointing upon the people. I pray, Lord, that there will be a special anointing that somehow through the word ministered this morning, 
that there'll be something that will burst in their hearts. It'll be that burst of faith that says, I am able to do exceeding abundantly above what I can even ask or think if I will just trust God. Let faith burst like a flower in the spring in their hearts, we pray. In their spirits, we pray. In Jesus' powerful name, amen.